dear friends, this is Mike and once again, I thank you for joining us on this week's session for our continuing series on Biblical Foundations 2. Now, uh, as I have said previously, this is really a starting point where you can navigate through your faith for the future and this is where we take the time to understand maybe challenging concepts in the Word of God, in the Bible, so that we can live and apply these things in our life and continue on in our faith and in following Jesus. So as we begin, um, you know, many of you uh, are perhaps today thinking and purchasing your way through a lot of uh, online shopping. Um, me and my wife, we have pretty much uh, shopped online for the majority of our needs. And e-commerce is really uh, at an all-time high, especially in our current scenario. And I, and I opened that, that as an introduction because whenever you go online shopping, whenever you browse through products and all of these things that are available online, there's always one thing that uh, you um, have to check. In fact, if you don't check this, you haven't done your e-shopping well. What is it? It is counting or checking the cost, right? No matter how great or quality of a product it is, you really have to count or check the cost of acquiring that product. And so I begin that as a way of uh, introduction today because what we're going to be talking about today is this, knowing the cost or checking the price behind the basis of our salvation. This is session number two, and we're going to be talking about um, what is the basis for our forgiveness? How are we forgiven in Christ? What is the cost that which must be paid in order for us to be secured in our salvation, in our redemption? And so as a starting point to this, let's go to where it all began. You know, when we go to the Bible, the book of beginnings is called Genesis. And if you have read the book of Genesis before, it starts all in the garden. A garden that God had created himself after creating the entire universe for six days and resting on the seventh. It is in this environment or in this context that we see the very uh, human beings that he created found in Adam and Eve. And so if you check this uh, picture right here, uh, it's very familiar, right? That they're in the garden, that they're tending the, all of the animals, taking care of the, the plants and all of the, the crops and all of that. But then one day, um, this sinister serpent walks in and tempts Eve to eat of the fruit, right? The fruit of the, no of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so we see there that this is the command that God gave them. Don't eat of that tree, right? You can eat of all of the trees in the garden except that one. And so what happens next is that Eve falls into temptation. And as she does that, her husband also, Adam, falls into sin. And this is what we call uh, sometimes the original sin or the first uh, occurrence of uh, people sinning against God's commands. And so in Genesis 1 verse 7, we see, look at what happens right after they sin. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. You see, uh, the, the human tendency after falling into disobedience or into sin is what? They sewed fig leaves together and made a covering for themselves. Out of the shame and out of the guilt of their own sin against God, they made a covering for themselves by putting together and sewing fig leaves. You see, uh, they desperately wanted to cover their shame, their disobedience, their nakedness, and they tried to make a covering for themselves. Well, later on, God, in uh, verses 9 to 10 says the Lord God called the man where are you you see he calls Adam because he is the one responsible for the marriage relationship and so he calls to the man where are you in fact he already knows where they are and verse 10 says he answered this is Adam 
I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. You see, God calls for Adam and Eve to face him, but they hide themselves instead out of fear. You see, what I realized is sin breaks our access or our fellowship with God. Uh, in the very first account of sin in the history of humanity, Adam and Eve breaks fellowship with God. They are separated because of their sin from God. And you know, that's what sin does. Even now and today in our present situation, sin separates us. And in fact, it does more than that. It engulfs us in fear, in guilt, and in shame. So this is what sin does. And so what, they, what did they do? They hid. And later on, uh, God says all of these effects, all of the curses on the land, and what the repercussions of sin were to be on Adam and Eve. And in verse 15, look at this. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's now referring to the serpent who tempted Eve. And between your offspring and hers. And he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now, what is this, what is this all talking about? You see, after saying all of the curses, the repercussions, the consequences of sin upon Adam and Eve that they have to work and till the soil, that Eve has to give birth and uh, childbirth will be painful to her. He now addresses the serpent and he says for the first time ever, he proclaims that at the end of all of this enmity, enmity that he, the offspring of the woman, will in fact crush the head of the serpent. But not, notwithstanding that the serpent will also strike his heel. Well, this could mean that the serpent will inflict a blow to the, to the offspring of Eve, maybe a temporary debilitating wound or injury. But the end of it, the, the, what will happen is that the offspring will indeed crush the serpent's head and uh, end up in his destruction or in his death. Now, some commentators and theologians call this the Proto-Evangelion. This is the very first mention of the good news of redemption that God has planned for humanity to be reconciled back to Him. So that, like Adam and Eve, we don't have to live in fear, hiding ourselves, making a covering for us. It's that God has a plan to redeem us, to actually forgive our sins, and to bring us back to himself and that is why this is so important because after God proclaims the the first uh, ever uh, news of this good news which we call the gospel uh, a few verses later he, he he does this right so after God proclaims the plan of the good news he now fulfills it and actually executes it look in verse 21 the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. Now, if you're just reading briskly through Genesis, you might miss this, but this is so crucial because for the very first time, God did an act of mercy in sparing Adam and Eve from living forever in their sinful and fallen state. Why? Because in the Garden of Eden, there was also the Tree of Life. So if they ate of this the fruit of the tree of life. They would forever live within their fallen state of sin. So what does God do? He vanquishes them. He banishes them from the Garden of Eden. But before He does that, as an act of mercy, He clothes them with garments of skin. Now, it's important for us to know that this is not just another covering that Adam and Eve did for themselves with the fig leaves. No, this is a garment of skin, meaning there had to be an animal that was killed for God to clothe them with this garment. And so, what happens next is the very first animal sacrifice on behalf of us fallen creatures. And this is what God did. He shed and slaughtered the first animal so that He can clothe Adam and Eve with covering. And you see the significance of this. What does this have to do with our topic for today? Well, it sets the grand stage in God's redemptive plan for humanity. How He will actually make a way for us 
to be free of sin. And we don't have to make coverings for ourselves because He indeed, as our God, will be the one to make covering for us and for our sins. You see, that picture, this picture, is the very first image of the sacrifice that is necessary to give us covering and to atone for our sins. And so I remember a hymn as I was preparing for this message. And it is a hymn by Robert Laurie. And in it, he says, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And he continues, O oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And so as we begin, our topic for today is really the blood of Christ. The basis of our salvation, the cost that must be paid is none other than the blood of Christ to cover us and to atone for our sins. I've entitled this message so that we can remember it more clearly, is that nothing, nothing at all, but the blood of Christ can make me clean. Now, with this, regarding this, we remember a verse that we studied last week, right? Romans 6, verse 23. Let's all read this together. For the wages of sin is what? Death, right? The payment for sin is actually death. It requires death. But the gift or the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So I start with this verse because why? We must understand that our sin must be paid for. And the, the due payment for sin is actually death. You see, it uses a, a word here, wages, which means sueldo, which means your, your, your paycheck, right? What do you do? You work for 15 days or two weeks, and then after uh, giving that kind of work, you are recompensed for your work. You are given your salary or your paycheck, and you you get what you deserve, essentially. And so, the writer of this verse uses the same term, the wages. We get what we will deserve, right? So we sin and we get what we deserve by our sin, which is death. So we must be paid for in this sin through death. Which means all of us, every single person who has ever lived, is actually born into a state of sin, that we are all sinners, and we must pay for our sin by death. Now, here's the thing. In Hebrews 9.22, it says, In fact, the law, okay, the commandments of God, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, right? And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. What does this all mean? What does God require as the payment for our sin? Well, it requires death, the shedding of blood. You see, this, this, this whole idea of blood being used or a sacrifice being used to cover our sin, we can trace that all from Genesis down to Revelation and down through the ages, how God communicated Himself and His plan of redemption for us. Now, you may be asking, why blood, right? Well, life is in the blood. I have blood coursing through my veins now, which means that I am alive, right? And so life is in the blood. And when blood is shed, right, life is taken. And God wants us to realize that sin is such a serious offense against Him, who is perfect and holy and just, that it requires a life to pay for our sins. I remember, if you can look to this picture right now, this is um, a certain aspect of Israel's history. You remember who this guy is? This is Moses. And before he was actually able to lead uh, the people of God, the Israelites, from slavery in Egypt, something had to happen. You remember that? Before they were delivered from Egypt, down, going to the Promised Land, there had to be something that occurred. Now, for some of you who have watched the movies about this, uh, these are the ten plagues upon Egypt. 
where God showed his mighty hand to tell Pharaoh to let his people go. And out of those 10 plagues, the final climactic plague was plague number 10, the death of the firstborn of all the land. And so we get this in Exodus 12, verse 12, where God instructs Moses, hey, this is how you survive through the last plague because it's going to affect both you and the Egyptians, both Israel, Israelites and Egyptians in the land. And he is going to send forth his angel of death to kill all of the firstborn. And so if you're Moses, you're going to be thinking like, oh no, this is bad. This is really bad. God is going to wipe out the entire firstborn population. Yung mga panganay, mamamatay sila. And so God instructs Moses in, uh, in Exodus 12 verse 12, On the same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals. And I will bring what? Judgment. Okay? Judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. See? So this is bad news, right? God is going to wipe out all of the firstborn, including even animals. And so in verse 13, he says, The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Okay? So he gets the news that all the firstborn were going to be killed. But he tells them, if there is blood as a sign, I will pass over you. What was the last plague? God was going to strike down and kill all of the firstborn. But there is a way for you to be spared of this judgment, of this destruction and death. And it is none other than blood. Now, in Exodus 12 verse 3, earlier on in this chapter, he says, Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb, okay, an animal, for his family, one for each household. So he is to take a lamb. And further, the verse 5 says, The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect. And you may take them from the sheep or the goats. So, so in other words, God is requiring a sacrifice, a kind of lamb that is unblemished. Okay, It's perfect. It has to have no defect. It has to be a male and it has to be a year old. And what are they going to do with this lamb? Well, let's go back. In verse 21 to 23, it says this, Then Moses summoned all of the elders of Israel, all of the leaders, and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. So that is where we get this first ever title or phrase, the Passover lamb. This is the animal, animal upon which they will sacrifice which will be their guarantee or their safety as the angel of death plagues Egypt and will destroy with him all of the firstborn animals and children. And so in verse 22, it says, take a bunch of hyssop. This is like a branch or uh, a branch with leaves. Dip it into the blood in the basin and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frames, on your doorposts. Not one of you shall go out the door of his house until morning. So what they essentially did after selecting the Passover lamb for each household was that they broke its neck and then it slit the throat and then they shed the blood of this lamb without blemish. And with that blood, they painted on their doorposts pretty much like this so that this would be the sign or the symbol for them to be safe and secure from the angel of death that would plague Egypt. The following verses in verse 23 says, When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the doorframe and will pass over the doorway, and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. You see, with the blood of the sprinkled lamb sacrifice on their doorposts, they will remain safe. They will be passed over by the angel of death, the destroyer, which is called uh, here to strike down the firstborn. Now, 
you might be thinking, if you were an Israelite, if you were Moses instructing these people to shed this innocent animal's life for you to be safe, right? Well, what in the world does this mean? It's so bloody and messy. It's like you're 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 killing an animal and, and you're painting that that the blood of it on your doorpost. And so you see, we understand now that whatever God instructs Moses to do, and all of the people for that matter, it requires faith. It requires faith in the approach, the method that God instructs for the Israelites to do. And so they, we understand that God is creating in them this trust that you may not understand what I'm instructing you to do, but later on you will see why I instructed this. And so the Passover lamb, as we get it, has been instructed to the Israelites and the rest is history. That night, that same night, the angel of death went through all of Egypt and killed the firstborn, including the firstborn son of the Pharaoh. And after that, the Pharaoh allowed the Israelites to go and to be freed from slavery in Egypt. That is the story of how this Passover lamb came to be. And in fact, later on, when Moses was creating, or when God was creating the, the sacrificial system, they, he wanted them to remember, to commemorate this Passover. And so the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. This is the area in which uh, God spoke to Moses on behalf of the people. And he said, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when any of you brings an offering to the Lord, bring as your offering an animal from either the herd or the flock. So it's essentially the same animal sacrifice, the offering. Bring an, a male animal from the herd without defect. And so God instituted this animal sacrifice so that the Israelites can remember what God did for them as he set them free from slavery in Egypt. Now, some uh, theologians will call this word atonement. Atonement. What does that mean? Atonement means the action of making amends for a wrong that, is, that was done. And so the people were instructed, for you to atone for your sins, you have to bring an offering to the Lord. You have to have a payment to make amends, which symbolized that this was indeed the animal offering to the Lord. Leviticus 17 verse 11 says, For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. In other words, God is saying through Moses, a life for a life, a blood for your own life. And the blood of this animal would actually form somewhat of a covering for your sins. And so in verse 3, he says, If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he is to offer a meal without defect. He must present it at the entrance to the tent of meeting so that it will be acceptable to the Lord. So it means that this should be acceptable to the Lord. What was required if someone sinned against God or disobeyed against God? He was to bring an animal that is acceptable to the Lord. In verse 4, he says, He is to lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. He was to lay his hand on the animal, and then after that, kill it. Right? Life for life, blood for blood. The sinner, in fact, was transferring, okay, somewhat transferring his sins to the animal so that on his behalf, the animal's blood would make atonement for him. We call this substitution, uh, where something or someone is taking the place for someone else for punishment. And so we as sinners, we, we deserve punishment for our sins. And yet, through this sacrificial system, God is showing the Israelites how to actually atone for their sins, to make a covering for their sins, and to actually show them the seriousness of their sins and disobedience against God. Life for life, blood for blood. And in verse 5, he says, He is to slaughter the young bull before the Lord, and then Aaron's sons, the priests, shall bring the blood and sprinkle it 
against the altar on all sides at the entrance to the tent of meeting. The priest shall sprinkle the blood on the altar, signifying the sacrifices for the people on behalf of the nation of Israel so that they could be acceptable before God. And guess what? They had to do this again and again and again. If you sin, you have to sacrifice an animal on the temple, at the altar, again and again. And yearly, the priests and the high priest did this. They sacrificed these animals to make covering and atonement for their sins. And so we might be thinking nowadays, that was the time back then. That was the Old Testament way of animal sacrifice. But today, you know what? It is not all that far from how people treat their sin. In fact, I want us to think about this question. What are you covering your sin with? Just like Adam and Eve in the garden when they sinned against God, they make a covering for themselves to make themselves uh, feel better about their sin. They make a covering to, to atone for their sins. They sew fig leaves. And even the Israelites, they sacrificed animals so that they would somehow be acceptable before God. You see, today, not much is different. Many people try to cover their sins in a variety of ways. Let me share with you a few examples. Some people try to cover for their sins through therapy. They, they, they will tell you that you just need to love yourself more. Um, they will try to uh, change their behaviors in such a way that they could be acceptable. Some people, they blame others. They have this victim mentality because this is what, what happened to me. And therefore, this is why I do this. This is why I sin. This is the way that they treat or cover their sin. They blame others. They have that victim mentality. Now, number three, some people, they try to cover their sin with charity. They try to make good works that can potentially outweigh their bad works. They try to do good so that the, their good works would outweigh their bad and somehow they would be acceptable before God. Other people, they choose religion and spirituality. Um, they, they, they do all of these sacrifices again and again. And they do sometimes even self-hurt to signify their penitence before God so that they can somehow be made acceptable before Him. Others, they choose to deny their sin. They just say that it's part of life. It's just being human, right? Uh, some people, they forget. They try to forget their sins. They make themselves numb to their sins through alcohol or drugs or relationships. They try to forget all of these wrong things that they have done. And some people, that's why they, they actually uh, become depressive or even suicidal because the guilt and the shame of sin is still there. The sting of it that, man, I'm not going to be acceptable before God because of this sin. That's why they result to um, these depressive emotions and this anxiety over the future. And so even today, people are trying to make a covering. They're trying to atone for their sins. But what is our message for today? Nothing, nothing at all of what we can do, but nothing but the blood of Christ can make us clean from our sins. See, nothing at all that we can do, not our good works, not our charity, not our spirituality, not even our status, not even what we do can ever make us clean apart from the blood of Christ. You see, the good news is, even though we are sinners, God shows and manifests His love towards us. He wants us not to be separated from Him, not to be condemned by our sin, but He, like Adam and Eve, He creates a covering for us. He creates atonement for us in a way that is outside of ourselves. Look at this. In 1 John 4.10, it says, This is love, not that we love God, not that because of our love for God that we are made acceptable before Him. No, no, no. But that He loved us. See, God is the first lover. He loves us. And look, and He sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. See, out of His love, He sent Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And so that's why... Um, when Jesus was 
came to begin his ministry on earth. Um, we see this in John chapter 1, verse 29. John the Baptist actually called Jesus a very, very interesting title. He says, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That is incredible. That is what John the Baptist, the forerunner to the Messiah, okay, the last ever prophet of the Old Testament, that's what he calls Jesus, the Lamb of God. You see, he was talking to the Israelites, the people who would listen to him. They knew that image that the Lamb of God, not only a Passover Lamb, but the Messiah Lamb of God, would come away, would come to this earth, and that He would take away the sin of the world, not just cover, okay? Because when they did an animal sacrifice, that would temporarily cover their sin. But here He says, who takes away, ultimately, completely, the sin of the world. So what was required again? If someone sinned, a lamb. But here, the Lamb of God finally comes into the picture. The image that we saw previously in the Old Testament now coming to fulfillment. And what is the mission of Jesus? To take away the sins of the world. In fact, in 1 Peter, Peter says this in verse 18, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold that you were redeemed or in other words paid for ransom from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers it's not by money or any silver or gold he says and in verse 19 he says but with the precious blood of christ a lamb without blemish or defect how did he describe jesus a lamb without blemish or defect perfect in every way and how are we redeemed by the precious blood of christ the lamb of god you see i think about this and, and i ask why is christ's blood so precious what makes it so different what makes it so unique that it can actually redeem us and buy us out of our sin well it is the only blood in all of history which is of human and divine attribute. Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man, and in His blood is the worthwhile payment for sin. In fact, it is the only acceptable payment for sin. Life for life, blood for blood. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 gives further credence to this. He says, God made Him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. You see, Jesus was perfect. He was fully obedient to the Father. He had no sin. Although He was tempted, He did not disobey the Lord at any instant, at any moment. And so He who had no sin became sin for us on that cross, so that we might become the righteousness of God. This is what they call the great exchange, where upon the cross, Jesus takes our sin and we take his righteousness. That is the double exchange that happened for whoever believes in Jesus Christ, his person and his finished work on the cross. In fact, when we skip to uh, Matthew 26, verses 1 to 2, um, this is Jesus now nearing his death on the uh, on the cross, nearing his betrayal and his arrest, he says this, When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, As you know, the Passover, there it is again, it is, it is again conveyed to us, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. See, if you check your history, if you read your Bible, you will know that Jesus died at the time of what? The Feast of the Passover. It's the same feast that the Jews commemorate when they were delivered out of slavery from Egypt, where they were set free under the leadership of Moses through the Passover lamb. It is during this feast that Jesus was also crucified. And what did Jesus do in order to communicate this to his disciples, to his followers? 
he inaugurated the Last Supper as the celebration for the Passover meal. Only this time, it will be the very last time that they celebrate this Passover meal because Jesus was about to accomplish something greater than the Passover lamb. He was himself to be the Lamb of God who would atone for the sins of the world. And so in Matthew 26, verse 28, we find this in the Last Supper where Jesus celebrates the Passover meal with his disciples. He says, this is my blood of the covenant, the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. What is Jesus claiming here? He will pour out his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. In the same way that the Passover lamb, after shedding its blood, had to be eaten by the Israelites, so here Jesus is instituting the Lord's Supper for his followers that they too would partake of the Lamb of God. And this is why he inaugurated communion or the Lord's Supper. When we partake of the bread, signifying his broken body, and when we drink of the wine or the juice, signifying his shed blood for us on the cross. See, that is what Jesus did. That is how we commemorate, we remember, we celebrate what he did on that cross 2,000 years ago. The blood of the Lamb was shed for you and for me so that our sins would be taken away, so that our sins would be atoned for. And a few hours later, Jesus died the death that we were supposed to die. Jesus was the only one who could pay for our sins because he was sinless and perfect. And so, on that afternoon on Friday, it says that Jesus died. He gave his last breath. And that was, in fact, the very same time that the Passover lambs were being slaughtered near the temple. And that signifies to us that indeed Jesus is the Lamb who was slain for the sins of the world. And in the same way, that is what we as Christ followers, as Christ believers, that is what we hold on to. That He is our perfect Lamb who was sacrificed on our behalf. He was the substitute for us. We should have been the one dying on that cross, paying for our sins, because the payment for our sins is death. Instead, He died for us. I like what Oswald Chambers said, that when Jesus Christ shed His blood on the cross, it was not the blood of a martyr or the blood of one man for another. No, it was the life of God poured out to redeem the entire world. And you see, that is why his sacrifice was greater than all of the animal sacrifices from the past. And that is why only Jesus' sacrifice on the cross could ever pay for all of our sins. As Colossians 2, verses 13 to 14, this is what we discussed previously. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, all of us are sinners, even in our nature. God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all of our sins. You see, the blood of Jesus is sufficient. In fact, it is able to cover all of our sins. And verse 14 says, Having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us, He took it away, nailing it to the cross. You see, this was the code, the written code, the list of all of our sins, how we have broken God's laws and God's commandments, and He nailed it on that cross. See, Jesus paid for all of our sins in advance through His cross. And that's why Colossians 1 verse 20 also says, And through Jesus, through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross did you see, did you hear that he made peace with us who are enemies of god because of our sin he made peace by the blood of his cross indeed the blood of christ brings us reconciliation 
and peace with the Father. All of our sins were paid for in advance. At the death of Jesus, 33 AD, more than about 2,000 years ago, all of our past sins, the things that we have done and committed in the past, even the present sins that we struggle with, and even the future sins that we have not yet committed, all of those are paid for by the blood of the Lamb. Our certificate of debt was canceled, and He took it all for us. Ephesians 1 verse 7 says that in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us. You see, folks, we don't deserve this. In fact, we deserve death and separation from God. But because of His love lavished on us, Jesus died and shed His blood 2,000 years ago for us. And so as we wrap up our time here, I just want to go through uh, a couple of verses in Hebrews 9-10. to If you want to study more about the blood of Jesus Christ, this is where you go to. Hebrews chapter 9 and 10. And this is where it really um, emphasizes the covering or uh, the effect of Jesus' blood. In Hebrews 9 verse 14, it says this, How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself unblemished, perfect to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God. You see, prior to this, they were depending on animal sacrifices as substitutes. But the, the writer of Hebrews says, How much more will the blood of Christ be sufficient, be more than enough to cleanse us of all of our consciences so that we can serve the living God? That is why the next verse tells us that for this reason, Christ is the mediator. He is the mediator of a new covenant through His blood. You see, Christ was the propitiation. What does that word mean? Propitiation means to avert God's wrath upon us. He was the ultimate payment so that God's wrath would be displayed on that cross. And He was the expiation for us to cover our sin. You see, those things Jesus did on the cross to cover our sin and to take the wrath of God for us on our behalf on that cross. And later on in Hebrews 10, 10, it says, And by that will, that God's will, that we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the blood, the body of Jesus Christ, once for all. Say that with me again. Once for all. Meaning, Jesus only did the sacrifice once and for all and it was enough that is why on the cross he says it is finished look he reiterates in verse 11 day after day every priest stands and performs his religious duties to offer the animal sacrifices again and again he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins it can never be enough that's why they have to do it again and again and again day after day year after year but God did this so that he can show us that there is something better to come that ultimately all of these sacrifices will culminate in the person of Jesus in his life death and in his resurrection in verse 12 of Hebrews 10 and when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins he's referring to jesus our great high priest he sat down at the right hand of god meaning the only time that a priest can sit down was that when his work was finished and so jesus as our great mediator our great high priest he shed his blood for us and offered it once and for all and he sat down at the right hand of god and since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. This verse tells us that there will come a day that Jesus will rule and reign over his enemies, including those who denied him, those who rejected him. And verse 14 says, Because by one sacrifice, how many again? 
just one. He has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. What does it mean to be made holy? It is to be made more Christ-like, to look more and more like Christ in our thoughts, in our, in our lives, in our actions, in our words. And he says, by one sacrifice, the only sacrifice necessary, we are being made perfect. We are being made holy. See, the priests, they offer the same sacrifice again and again, but only Jesus' sacrifice was offered once, and it was enough. In verse 19, later on, he encourages us, he exhorts us, the writer of Hebrews says in verse 19, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, again, by the blood of Jesus, we can have access to God the Father on high. We have that confidence to enter into the presence of God through the blood of Christ. Wow, isn't that amazing? Through the blood of Christ, we have confidence to actually approach God's heavenly place, His presence. Unlike Adam and Eve and all the sinners previously, that they could only cover themselves, they can hide from God. But we have the confidence to approach Him. And in verse 20, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is His body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, see, not only has He paved the way for us, to be reunited and reconciled with God. He has opened up a new and living way for us, a new way that we can live our lives here on earth through His blood, through His power and His grace. And verse 22, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, full assurance of faith. You see, you, you don't have to be afraid anymore. You don't have to doubt your salvation anymore. You have full assurance of faith why? Because of the blood of Christ. Having our hearts sprinkled. There it is again, that same word. Sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. It is only the blood of Christ that can give our hearts full assurance. It is only the blood of Christ sprinkled upon us that our guilty consciences can in fact be forgiven and that we can make, be washed with pure water only through the blood of Christ. And verse 23 to 24, he now admonishes us, he encourages us, let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess, to the faith, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another toward love and good deeds. Now it's interesting here, he uses the word spur. This is like the same thing that you use for a horse to make it run, it's the same word that is on the boots of the cowboys. They, they hit uh, the animal on its side so that it would run. And so we are encouraged to spur one another towards love and good deeds because of what Jesus has done for us. And so how do we persevere in our faith? How do we move unswervingly with the hope that we profess? We do it alongside one another. And that's why it's so important for us to belong to a small group, to belong to a, a, a small gathering of believers so that we can encourage one another in these truths. And in verse 25, finally he says, Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. What is the day here? It's capital letter D, day. Well, that day is the day of Jesus Christ's return, that He comes to this earth and He rules and reigns and He brings with Him the new heavens and the new earth. Until that time, until Jesus returns, we are to encourage one another in the faith. We are to keep gathering together as God's people who have been bought by His blood, the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. That is the beauty of belonging to a church that is why at CCF, we, we continually encourage one another through these small group settings, even in our satellites. In, in all of our church gatherings, we continue to encourage one another with these things. And he ends in verse 26, 27. 
If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth that Jesus Christ has paid for our sins by His blood, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. You see, this verse tells us that there are only two people, exactly two categories of people, those who are covered by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. Their sins are forgiven. They have turned over their lives. They have surrendered their lives to His Lordship. And they consider Him as their Savior. And the second group of people is those who have rejected this sacrifice. Those who have not believed in the finished work of Jesus. And the writer of Hebrews says, it is they who only have a fearful expectation of judgment. Whereas the followers of Christ, they have full confidence and assurance. They can draw near to God because of Christ's blood. But these guys, they have a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire, symbolizing punishment for those who reject the Messiah, the Lamb of God. And so, right now, we understand that there is this image that God has been painting for generations now, for years upon thousands of years, that there needs to be sacrifice for sin, life for life, blood for blood. And though the people from before did not fully realize, they did it by faith. And even so, for us today, we by faith believe in the finished work of Jesus 2,000 years ago. And we see the image come becoming more clear and becoming more evident to us. And so like a painting that is unfinished, we see every brush stroke, we see every part of it slowly coming together. And at first it doesn't make sense. We don't realize its significance. But in the end, we see the full picture, the full image of what God was trying to do. That from the get-go, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, He was creating a way for us to be redeemed, to be atoned for, for our sins, to take away our sins. God is showing us through the previous animal sacrifices a preview of what's to come, of eventually how He will fulfill the animal sacrifice through none other than Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. What's our message for today? Nothing but the blood of Christ can make me clean. You can speak this, this word or this statement to yourself today if you're struggling with sin, if you're struggling with condemnation, if you're struggling with a guilty conscience that indeed because of the blood of Christ and how you entrust yourself to Him, that you are free from the guilt and shame and condemnation of sin. Romans 5 verse 9 says this, Since we have now been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him, Jesus Christ? See, we have been justified by His blood, and therefore there is no more wrath from God. That we can be assured of our salvation again and again through the blood of Christ. As we close, I just want to bring you through a, a couple of practical application points uh, gathering from Hebrews 10. And this is really a way for you to apply after hearing this message so that we can be doers of the word and not merely listeners. Number one, we have confidence to enter into God's presence through the blood of Jesus. How is your confidence today? Do you have access to God? Do you openly pray to Him? Do you have an intimate relationship and fellowship with Him? Well, guess what? If you are in Christ, and indeed the blood of Him, His Son is covering you, then you have complete access to God the Father. Number two, we are to draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. The Bible says, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. And so if you've been in a season of dryness or you've been far away from God, you've been walking on your own, 
Today is the day that you can actually draw near to Him through the blood of Christ with a sincere heart and be assured in your faith. Number three, we are told to hold fast to our confession of faith. How are you in persevering? How are you in moving forward in your faith? Is your faith growing greater day by day or is it waning? See, the blood of Christ enables us to hold fast unswervingly. And number four, we must love others as a sign that we truly love Him and belong to Him. See, if the blood of Christ has indeed cleansed us, the natural, the supernatural overflow is love for God and love for others. And lastly, we are not to forsake meeting together and we are not to give up encouraging one another but all the more we continue um, that's why we we invite you if you are not yet part of a small group please do sign up or comment or message us so that we can help you find a group that you can meet with uh, especially during our times today we all the more need encouragement to spur one another towards love and good deeds to point each other to christ and last we are not to keep on sinning in fact, there was such a great price that was paid for our sins that we would do well not to anymore be entangled by sin, but to repent of it daily and to turn for Christ, to turn towards Christ for renewal, for grace, for mercy. So we conclude with this, our memory verse for today. Why don't we all read this together? Hebrews 9.22 In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Why don't we close in a word of prayer? Why don't we bow our heads and join our hearts? Father God, indeed, you are a holy and just and righteous God. That there can be no sin in your presence. That there can be no shortcoming whatsoever. Because you are holy, O Lord. And us, Lord, we are sinners. We have done wrong. We have disobeyed you. And we have fallen short in every way. And Lord, we are separated from you because of our sin. But Lord, we thank you that because of your love, because of your grace and mercy, you have made a way for us to be reconciled, to be reunited with you. And that is through your Son, Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God, that He takes away our sin. He grants forgiveness to us through His blood. So, Lord, I pray for my friends here today. For many of us, Lord, we are still covering our own sins with our own ways and our own devices. We're trying to atone for our sins in our own human ways. But I pray that today we will depend on nothing else, nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ that can cleanse us and make us white as snow. Indeed, Lord, because of Christ, we have access to you. We can draw near to you and we can have confidence and full assurance that we are reunited with you in an intimate and loving covenant relationship. And this was accomplished for us through the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf on that cross. We believe upon His finished work that even though He was crucified unto death, He was buried, but on the third day He rose again to signify that whoever believes in Him, they have eternal life, they have forgiveness of sins, they have full assurance because of the shed blood of Jesus, the Messiah. So we thank you, Lord, for this gracious truth. And we pray that you will help us to live it out in our lives every day, every moment, in dependence on your spirit and by your grace. We thank you, Lord, and we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you all.